you have a Bible, and I hope you do, let me invite you to open with me to Matthew chapter 26. As we put a temporary pause on where we have been in the book of Matthew, to jump ahead for these next two weeks to the end of Matthew, to tread on some of the most holy ground in all of Scripture. As we prepare to enter into this holy week, this week when we remember the arrest and trial and crucifixion and death of our Lord, the, th- the very thought of it just is stunning and sobering at the same time. I wanted us to pause where we are in Matthew and go ahead and jump to the climax of the book. This week we will be in Matthew 26 and 27 and see the cross of Christ. Next week, of course, on Easter, the beginning of Matthew 28, the resurrection of Christ. But tonight, I want us to look at the event that I've called at the top of your notes there, the centerpiece of all history and the determinant of our eternity. The cross of Christ is the key to understanding everything in history and everything in your life forever. E. Stanley Jones said the cross is the key. If I lose this key, I fumble. The universe will not open to me. But with this key in my hand, I know I hold its secret. It's a big statement to say that what we're about to read tonight is the key to understanding everything in your life and everything in all history forever. But I want to show you tonight why I make that statement. What I want us to do is I want us to read through, we're going to read a long passage of Scripture, Matthew 26 and 27. We're going to read both chapters all at once. Then I want us to step back and contemplate the reality that we have just read. I'm going to approach this text with a, a bit of a sense of trembling. Charles Spurgeon, when he was talking about the text where we see the, Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said this, and I think it can apply to the entire text that we're reading tonight. He said, here we come to the holy of holies of our Lord's life on earth. This is a mystery like that which Moses saw when the bush burned with fire and was not consumed. No man can rightly expound such a passage as this. It was a subject for prayerful, heartbroken meditation, more than for human language. Another writer said, surely this is a passage that we must approach on our knees. And D.A. Carson, who wrote one of my favorite commentaries on Matthew, said, as Jesus' death was unique, so also was his anguish. And our, our best response to it is hushed worship. So let's read this text that discloses, that discloses the center of all history and the determinant of every single one of our eternal destinies in this room. Matthew chapter 26, verse 1. When Jesus had finished all these sayings, He said to his disciples, You know that after two days the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people gathered in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they said, Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. Now when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him with an alabaster flask, a very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at table. And when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. In pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. 
Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then one of the twelve, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him thirty pieces of silver. And from that moment he sought an opportunity to betray him. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Where will you have us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he reclined at table with the twelve. And as they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful and began to say to him one after another, Is it I, Lord? He answered, He who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Judas, who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? He said to him, You have said so. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered him, Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. And Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, But as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. While he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you came to do. Then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father, and he will at once send me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then should the Scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. 
And those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered. And Peter was following him at a distance as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death. But they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last, two came forward and said, This man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, you have said so, but I tell you from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, he has uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? They answered, he deserves death. Then they spit in his face and struck him. And some slapped him, saying, prophesy to us, you Christ. Who is it that struck you? Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came up to him and said, you also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you mean. When he went out to the entrance, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you too are one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept. Bitterly. And morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate, the governor. Then when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. They said, What is that to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed. And he went and hanged himself. But the chief priest, taking the pieces of silver, said, It is not lawful to put them into the treasury, since it is blood money. So they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field as a burial place for strangers. Therefore that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him on whom a price had been set by some of the sons of Israel, and they gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord directed me. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, Which of the two of you do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters And they gathered the whole battalion before him, and they stripped him 
and put a scarlet robe on him. And twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you were the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli. Lemabak sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. One of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the Son of God. There were also many women there, looking on from a distance, who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who also was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, will you remember how that imposter said while he was still alive? After three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he is risen from the dead and the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go, make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. Let's pray. Lord, help us to understand, we pray, the wonder of what we just read. Give us fresh eyes tonight, open hearts. We pray that by the power of your Spirit, you would take these words and you would apply their truth deeply to every heart in this room tonight that we might live and we might worship as we ought. 
In the name of Jesus the crucified, we pray. Amen. Okay, so what is it about what we just read that makes this the centerpiece of all history and the determinant of every single person in this room's eternal destiny? Well, if you were to ask me that question, I would start by saying first, you need to, we need to remember the holiness of God. Because a right understanding of the cross begins with a right understanding of God. And not just God, who He is, but man, who we are. Until we see God for who He is and ourselves for who we are, we will never see the cross for what it means. So we've got to start with seeing God and ourselves in light of God. And once we see God for who he is, ourselves for who we are, then we begin to discover the majesty and mystery and glory of the cross. So let's start with the holiness of God. What I've put in your notes there is an overview of his holiness that we're going to go through pretty quickly here. His glorious uniqueness. And I'll list different scriptures at different points you might want to write down. God is sovereign over all. Psalm 24, verse 1 and 2. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. God created all things. God knows all things. God sustains all things. And God owns all things. He is the author of creation, which means he has authority over creation. He has all authority. All the rights belong to him. 21st century American, you don't have rights. God has rights. He's sovereign over all. Now, in response, we have denounced his sovereignty. We have rebelled against the authority of God. This is the picture going back to the very first sin in Genesis chapter 3. Even though God said not to eat fruit from the tree, we're going to do it anyway. He's not Lord over us. We can do what we want. And that is evident in every single one of our lives. Every single person in this room has denounced the sovereignty of God, has rejected the lordship of God. Every single one of us. Second, God is righteous above all. He is right in all he does. Genesis 18, 25. Will not the judge of the earth do right? Psalm chapter 145, verse 17. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and loving toward all he has made. God is right. He is righteous in all his ways. God has never had a wrong thought. He has never possessed a wrong motive. He has never done a wrong deed. He has never said a wrong thing. Everything God does is right. Completely right. And we have despised his righteousness. We are the exact opposite. We have rebelled against his righteousness. There is nothing righteous in us. Romans 3.10. There's no one righteous, not even one. No one who does good. We're the complete opposite of God. We have wrong thoughts. We do wrong deeds. We possess wrong motives. We speak wrong things. He is totally right, and we have rebelled against his righteousness. Leading to the third characteristic of God, he is just in all his wrath. Because God is righteous, he hates sin. His justice flows from his righteousness. With God, a wrathful response to sin and evil is not just a possibility, it is an inevitability. Scripture uses over 20 different words to describe the wrath of God. Over 580 different references in the Bible to the wrath of God. The Old Testament makes clear that God's wrath is real, it is intense, it is personal, and it is steady. God's wrath is not mysterious or irrational. It's not unpredictable. It is always predictable. Evil provokes the wrath of God Every single time. This is the constant response 
of a righteous God towards sin, wrath. His wrath is pure. His wrath is loving. It is a very good thing that God hates that which destroys you and me. His wrath is loving. The New Testament only deepens the picture of God's wrath, showing us that God's wrath is continual. It's coming. We saw that in Matthew chapter 3. The king is coming, John the Baptist said, with a winnowing fork in his hand. God's wrath. Jesus, in John 3, 16, that verse, that chapter where we celebrate God's love, God so loved the world, he gave his one only son. You go 20 verses later to John 3, 36, and the Bible says, whoever believes in the son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. God's wrath is deserved. God's wrath is dreadful. God's wrath is eternal. God's wrath is final. The reality is, because God is holy, because He is righteous, and He is infinitely worthy, God is infinitely honorable, what that means is that one sin against God is an infinite offense, is an infinite dishonor, worthy of infinite punishment. I remind you, we've talked about this before on many occasions, I remind you it was one sin in Genesis chapter 3. They ate a piece of fruit. One act of disobedience. And Romans 5.12 says, from that one act of disobedience, condemnation came for all men. In all history, billions of people condemned from one sin. All the effects of sin that we see in the world. World wars and murder and rape and evil of all kinds. Natural disasters, tornadoes and tsunamis and hurricanes and earthquakes that wipe ten thousands of people off the place, face of the planet at one time, all of these things came from one sin. One sin brought about all of that. And, and we in this room have committed thousands of sins. Which is why Romans 3 makes clear that God is just in bringing his wrath on us. And yet we have disregarded his wrath. We, we pretend it's not there. We question, mock Ultimately, we ignore the wrath of God. The fourth attribute of God I want you to remember is that He is loving toward all His creation. 1 John 4, 16. We know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. God is love. And yet we have denied His love, meaning we have turned from His love. In the words of Romans 2, 4, we have shown contempt for the riches of His kindness and tolerance and patience toward us. We have not believed that he loves us, so we have turned aside to our own ways, and in so doing, we have denied his love. So with that background, we now come face to face with the question that is at the center of all the Bible. So if this is true, if God is sovereign and we have denounced his sovereignty, if God is righteous and we have despised his righteousness, if God is just in all his wrath and we have disregarded his wrath, if God is loving toward all his creation and we have denied his love, then how can a righteous God be loving to rebellious sinners who are due his wrath? If we are ever going to understand the cross, we must feel the weight of that question. Because this is the problem with which Scripture is ultimately concerned. It is the ultimate problem in all the universe. How can a sinful man be righteous before a holy God? There's no bigger problem in all the universe than that. No bigger problem in all history than that. How can a sinful man be Righteous before holy God. Let me show this to you. Go back in the Old Testament. One place we will turn. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 15. So I want to show you one verse. So go go to the middle of your Bible, Psalms, big book, a lot of chapters. Take a right. One book. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 15. I want to show you one one verse. I want us to see it together that, that depicts this tension clearly. It is all over Scripture. It's at the center, the heart of Scripture. How can a righteous God be loving to rebellious sinners who are due His wrath? Look at Proverbs chapter 17, verse 15, and follow along with me. This is key. The Bible says, Proverbs 17, 15, He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous are both alike 
an abomination to the Lord. Did you hear that? Read it again. He who justifies the wicked and condemns the righteous. They're both an abomination to the Lord. Now that makes sense to us, right? If a judge says to someone who is wicked, you are good. If a judge says to someone who is guilty, you're innocent, then that would be an abomination to us and to God. Likewise, if a judge were to look at someone who is innocent and say, guilty. If a judge were to look at someone who is, who is, who is right and say, you are wrong, that would be an abomination to the Lord. That makes sense to us. Now apply this to God and us. If God were to look at you and me in our wickedness and say, you are good. If God were to look at us in the guilt of our sin and say, you are innocent, you are right, that would be an abomination to who? To God. And that's a problem. It's a huge problem. As soon as God tells rebellious sinners that they are right before Him, God becomes an abomination to Himself. Do you see, do you feel the tension here? How can righteous God be loving toward rebellious sinners who are rightfully due His wrath? That is the fundamental problem in all the universe. Now, it's not the fundamental problem that we identify. You think about it. How many people in our culture are worried about how God can be just and kind to sinners at the same time? Not a lot of people losing sleep at night because God is being kind to sinners. On the contrary, we point the finger at God. And we say, how, how can you punish sinners? How can you, God, send people to hell? That's the question we ask. But the question the Bible asks is exactly the opposite. The question the Bible's asking is, God, how can you be just and right and holy and let rebels into heaven? This is where we realize that God's forgiveness of our sin is a threat to his character. John Stott said, forgiveness is for God the profoundest of problems. Bishop Westcott said, nothing superficially seems simpler than forgiveness, but nothing, if we look deeply, is more mysterious or more difficult. That's why you, that's what you heard when, when Matt earlier read Romans chapter 3, verse 25, the purpose of the cross was to show the righteousness of God because, we read this, because in his divine forbearance, in his patience, God had passed over former sins. That's the whole picture of the Old Testament, God passing over sins. Think about an example like 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13. So King David has committed adultery, he has lied, and he has murdered. The prophet Nathan confronts him, and David responds. The adultering, adulterer, liar, murderer responds and says, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan replies back to him, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. Did you hear that? Adultery, lying, murder, just passed over. Is that justice? No. If, if a judge today were to look at this case and say, I put adultery and murder away. Passover, you are, you are right. We would have that judge off the bench in a heartbeat. No question about it. That judge is not right. Do we realize this? God's forgiveness of our sin, God's forgiveness of your sin is a threat to his character. God cannot be just and yet acquit you and me in our sin, in our rebellion, in our belittling of his glory. He cannot just pass over it. If God were to overlook sin, his justice and his holiness would be completely compromised and he would no longer be God. And this is where we realize that before the cross is for anyone else's sake, the cross is for God's sake. At the cross, God is showing, displaying his justice and his righteousness towards sin. For whom did Christ die? You? Me? It's part of it. But that answer is incomplete. For the nations, still incomplete. Ultimately, Christ died died for God. 
Watchman Nee said, if I would appreciate the blood of Christ, I must accept God's valuation of it, for the blood is not primarily for me, but for God. We, we need to hear this in a day where we've heard some of us all of our lives, the gospel presented as God's answer to human problems. And it is that in many ways. But first and foremost, the cross, the gospel, is an answer to a divine problem. It is God's vindication and declaration of his own glory. God demonstrating his justice and his righteousness. This is what drove Jesus to the cross. John chapter 12, verse 27. Father, what shall I say? Save me from this hour? No, it's for this reason I came to this hour. Then he goes to the cross with these words on his lips. Father, glorify your name. People say, well, when Jesus was going to the cross, I was on his mind. Ladies and gentlemen, when Jesus was going to the cross, the Father was on his mind. He was going to the cross to demonstrate the glory of the Father. The cross is good news for God before it is good news for us. Christ died for God. And until we have a God-centered perspective of the cross, we will never understand its meaning. Remember the holiness of God and in light of that, then tremble at the horror of wickedness. Particularly the horror of wickedness that we see here in this text. So for generation after generation after generation, sins piling up, piling up, piling up. Evil of man, we see it just worse and worse all throughout the Old Testament. Now, coming to the tip of a spear here, as creation takes the creator in the flesh and mocks and murders him. And put in your notes just a summary of the wickedness of man that we see in different people at different places at different times in different ways. See Jew Jewish leaders rejecting, arresting, accusing, and judging the Son of God. Maybe one of the most telling sentences is Matthew chapter 26, verse 63. The high priest is sitting in judgment on Jesus and he says, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said to him, you have said so, but I tell you from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. What a statement. Jesus says, you are sitting in judgment of me, but there is coming a day when you will see me seated in judge of all. Push the high priest over the edge tears his robes and says, what more do we need to hear? What shall his sentence be? He deserves to die. And they spit in his face and strike him. Jewish leaders judging the very son of God. Then he's taken to Roman leaders, Pilate and Herod, who we don't read about Herod in here, where we see them sentencing and crucifying the son of God. Pilate, in response, gives the crowds the option Shall I release Jesus the Christ or this murderous insurrectionist named Barabbas? They yell out, crucify Jesus. Pilate tries to absolve himself of responsibility, but there is no question the responsibility is shared here between both Jewish and Roman leaders. It is Pilate who, who hands him over to be crucified. Sentencing and crucifying the Son of God, which leads to the soldiers when we see stripping, scourging, mocking, beating, and spitting on the Son of God. Taking that dreaded whip full of bone and lead and bound in the leather thongs and lashing Jesus' body to a bloody pulp. Tremble at the horror of wickedness as they twist a crown of thorns into his head and put a scepter in his hand and put a royal robe around his naked body and bow down and say, Hail the King of the Jews. Only to rise and push him toward the place where he would die the most degrading, shameful, and painful of all 
possible deaths. Nailed on a cross. All of this taking place while crowds are ridiculing, reviling, and shouting at the Son of God. You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you're the Son of God coming down from the cross, they derided him. Matthew says they were wagging their heads and yelling at him. But sadly, it's not just the crowds. In the middle of all this, what was most, maybe potentially most disheartening was the disciples betraying, denying, disobeying, scattering, and deserting the Son of God. Judas and Peter and others, after three years of walking with him, now nowhere to be found. Oh, tremble at the horror of wickedness. And not just their wickedness, our wickedness. Let me ask you a question. When you envision the passion narrative, where do you see yourself? Are you Simon carrying Jesus' cross for him? Are you with the women standing at a distance to watch these things? Mary standing at the cross, looking up at her son. The thief, who we find out in another gospel account, turns to Jesus and has to be remembered in paradise. The centurion, who after Jesus died, said, truly this man was the son of God. With whom do you identify? I'll tell you who I identify most with with the crowds who are yelling out, crucify him. And I would submit that to envision yourself anywhere else in this scene is to fool yourself. The old Negro spiritual asks, were you there when they crucified my Lord? And the answer is, absolutely we were there. Not as spectators, but as participants. Guilty participants plotting and scheming and betraying and bargaining and handing him over to be crucified. John Stott said, until you see the cross as that which is done by you, you will never appreciate that it is done for you. The great Scottish hymn writer wrote, "'Twas I that shed the sacred blood. I nailed him to the tree. I crucified the Christ of God. I joined the mockery. Of all that shouting multitude, I feel that I am one, and in that din of voices rude, I recognize my own. Around the cross, the throng I see, mocking the sufferers groan, yet still my voice, it seems to be as if I mocked alone. When you read Matthew 26 and 27, tremble not just at the wickedness of their hearts, tremble at the wickedness of your heart. And as you do, behold the humility of Christ. And this is where I want us to go below the surface. Okay, I'm guessing many, if not most people in this room have seen passion movie or you, you have images in your mind when you think of cross and scourging and spitting. You've got physical images in your mind and if we're not careful that's where we leave our understanding of the cross and all the things that to be honest sometimes preachers just almost over glamorize when it comes to the cross and we have passion plays to depict these things on the outside but this is where I want to remind you that these realities on the outside are merely representations of much deeper horror that is going on below the surface. And so, what I want to do is briefly give you three different words. We're going to go through these quickly based on three different scenes and what we read in Matthew 26 and 27 that help us to understand below the surface what is happening here. What Jesus is doing. First word, substitution. When Jesus went to the cross, he was dying our death. Scripture's clear, right? From the start, the payment for sin is death. But Jesus had no sin. So why are we reading a story about his death? Because he is our substitute. And this becomes clear in Matthew chapter 27, verse 26 through 29, when Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. See the significance here. You have Jesus 
and his disciples celebrating the Passover meal together. A meal that they ate every year to remember that day long ago in Egypt where all the Israelite homes took an innocent lamb and slaughtered it. And they put its blood over the doorposts of their houses so that when God, when he came to every Israelite and every Egyptian home, any home that did not have blood over the doorpost would see the firstborn son in that home die. But if there was the blood of a substitute, of a sacrifice over the doorpost, then that home was safe and spared the penalty of death because of a substitute. You can only be safe with the blood of the lamb over the doorpost of your house. And every year they would celebrate this meal. What would happen is Jewish people would come to the temple with lambs, all these lambs being slaughtered all over the place and their blood spilling out everywhere. It's a picture of that time back in Exodus when this happened. And so it's in that context that Jesus sits with his disciples over this meal and he says to them, This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus is the Passover lamb, Exodus 12, who saves us with his blood. So that when God's wrath and God's judgment comes to you and me, if we are hiding under the blood of a substitute sacrifice, Jesus the Lamb of God, we are saved. We are safe under the blood of a substitute sacrifice. But it's deeper even than that. He's not only the Passover lamb who saves us with his blood, he is the covenant keeper, Exodus 24, who seals us with his blood. This is Exodus 24, verse 8, when Jesus says, this is my blood of the covenant. That's the only time in the entire Gospel of Matthew where the word covenant is mentioned. Why is that important? Well, it takes us all the way back to Exodus 24 when God was entering into covenant with his people. He gave his law to them in Mount Sinai, a sacrifice of blood covering over their sins. But then Exodus 24, 8 says Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. This blood was not just a picture of their forgiveness, but this blood was a picture of God binding his people to himself in relationship with them. So the picture here, when Jesus talks about a new covenant sealed with blood, is not just for forgiveness of sins, but this is blood that binds sinners in a relationship with God forever. Our substitute sacrifice who seals us with his blood because he died the death we deserve to die. So that, here's the deal, before the cross, we were headed to eternal death. But now, because of the cross, we have eternal life. We have the promise that one day we're going to drink from the fruit of the vine in his father's kingdom with him. That's a promise. Those who trust in the substitute sacrifice of the son will live forever. Forever and ever and ever. And you get later in the story right after, remember right after Jesus was crucified, you see all these people coming out of tombs. There's all kinds of articles and discussion about exactly what is going on there. We don't have time to dive into it, but all agree one thing is clear. Because of the death of Christ as our substitute for sin, he makes resurrection to life possible for sinners. Before the cross, we were headed to eternal death. Because of the cross, we now have eternal life. Because of the substitution, Jesus died our death. Second word, propitiation. Jesus endured our condemnation. Propitiation, great word. That's how to spell it right there. Now, let me explain this word. We read it earlier together, Romans 3.25. God put Christ forward as a propitiation by his blood. What does that mean? Well, propitiation literally means one who turns aside wrath. And it makes sense in light of all that we've talked about tonight. God is holy and just in all his wrath, right? We are sinful, deserving of his wrath. So that when Jesus went to the cross, what he was doing was he was enduring the condemnation, the wrath that we deserve. This is key to understanding the cross. And it comes especially, it becomes especially clear in the Garden of Gethsemane, Matthew 26, 39, when Jesus is praying and he says, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Obviously, that kind of prayer begs the question, what in the world is this cup? And this is where we remember that the cup of the cross is not primarily physical suffering. It is predominantly spiritual suffering. What is causing Jesus 
anguish in the garden is not the prospect of what is about to happen to him physically, but the prospect of what is about to happen to him spiritually. And we know this because of the way the scripture talks about cup. Psalm chapter 75, verse 8. In the hand of the Lord is a cup full of foaming wine mixed with spices. He pours it out and all the wicked of the earth drink it down to its very dregs. Isaiah chapter 51, verse 17. You have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath. You have drained it to its dregs, the goblet that makes men stagger. They are filled with the wrath of the Lord and the rebuke of God. Jeremiah 25, 15. Take from my hand this cup filled with the wine of my wrath. Revelation 14, 10. Drink of the wine of God's fury, which is poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. The cup in scripture is a reference to the wrath of God that we deserve, that sinners deserve. So, remember this. When we see Jesus sorrowful and troubled in the garden, sweating blood in Gethsemane, realize he is not a coward about to face some Roman soldiers. He is a, a savior about to experience divine wrath. And when Jesus went to the cross, the full cup of the wrath of God, do your sin and my sin was poured out on his son. And he drank it down to its very dregs. When you see the cross, as you contemplate the cross this week, consider the reality that Jesus was enduring your condemnation and my condemnation. Think about it, the wonder and the beauty of how this all comes together. At the cross, God expresses his full judgment upon sin. At the same time at the cross, God endures his full judgment against sin. And in the process at the cross, God enables salvation for sinners. Full wrath, full love, all the characteristics of God, all the attributes of God converge at the cross in beautiful unity for the salvation of sinners. So that before the cross, we were afraid of God. We were objects of the wrath of God, deserving nothing but condemnation before God. But now, because of the cross, we are friends of God. Not afraid, friends, because of his propitiation, he endured the wrath of the Father so that we might know nothing but the love of the Father. Third word, reconciliation. Jesus suffered our separation. So when you get to Matthew chapter 27, verse 45, and Jesus on the cross cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What in the world does that mean? Follow with me. This cry on the cross is not a cry of unbelief, confusion, or despair. Jesus is not doubting the Father. He is not confused about what is happening, i.e., why are you doing this to me? As if he doesn't understand. He knows everything that's going on here, understands everything that goes, is going on here. He has foretold this moment, and he is willingly in this moment. There is no despair here. He is confident in the Father. Instead, this is a cry of physical agony, spiritual anguish, and relational alienation. It's a quote from Psalm 22. And understanding that psalm is key to understanding this cry. We don't have time to turn there and compare it all together. But it's clear, physical uh, f- physical agony. Psalm twenty-two, fourteen. They've pierced my hands and my feet. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men has encircled me. Spiritual anguish. Just like we talked about, Jesus is not just, he's no longer anticipating the wrath of God. He is experiencing the wrath of God. And not just for a moment, but for hours. Shrouded by darkness, seared with pain, he is experiencing the full cup of God's condemnation cry of spiritual, relational, spiritual anguish and relational alienation. Jesus is experiencing in a mysterious way alienation not only from his friends but from his father. This is the curse of the cross as Jesus came under the sentence of sin which sin involves separation from the father. We are seeing Jesus cut off from the father's favorable presence Favorable is the key word there. Because God's presence was real at the cross, but it was his presence in judgment and wrath towards sin. In a similar way that God's presence is real in hell. God is omnipresent. He is all places. Hell is a demonstration of his justice and wrath towards sin. 
And on the cross, Jesus was experiencing suffer- separation from the favor of the Father's presence as he was given the full recompense of our disobedience. This is the weight of 2 Corinthians 5, 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us in order that we might become the righteousness of God. He experienced the separation that we deserve so that we might receive reconciliation. And that's the effect of the cross. For all who trust in Jesus. Before the cross, we were cast out of God's presence. Right? In the sense of being cut off from God's favorable presence, separated from his love and his mercy, as good as the Bible says that in our sin we are alienated from God. But now, because of the cross, we are no longer cast out of God's presence. Because of the cross, we are now invited into God's presence. Oh, the wonder of this. That's why right after the cross, what happens? Temple of The curtain of the temple, torn in two from top to bottom. God destroying the barrier between man and himself, making a way for man to come to him. This barrier separating man from God. Think of it. Hell-deserving sinners now welcomed safely into the presence of holy God. Do you see it? You see why the cross is so significant? What is happening here is so much deeper than a naked man dying on a wooden post on the side of the road in a nondescript part of the world. This is the holy God of the universe giving his son to die our death, to endure our condemnation, to suffer our separation so that wicked sinners can be declared righteous and welcome in the presence of God. All of history revolves around this scene, and your life is determined by what you do in response to this scene. So surrender your heart to God. Sinner, turn from your sin and trust in the Savior today. Do not play religious games. There are some of you in here tonight who, you you came in here tonight knowing that 2,000 years or so ago, Jesus died on the cross. But for the first time, you're seeing the horror of your wickedness before a holy God and understanding for the first time why the cross of Christ was necessary for you to have any hope of life forever. And certainly, a response to this Savior involves more than attending church and praying a prayer and going through some motions, a response to this Savior warrants your life and your soul and your all. Surrender your heart to this God. Stop playing games before this God. Feel the wonder and the weight of the cross and fall on your face in worship. And when you do, Christian, do not toy with sin. Stop toying with sin, Christian. You've been freed by the blood of Christ from sin. Not just from its penalty, but from its power. Stop toying with it. Stop playing with it. Run from it by the mercy of God in Christ. Surrender your heart to God and and proclaim the hope of the gospel. Proclaim the hope of the gospel. Don't put your notes up. Follow with me here. Is this not the greatest news in all the world? There is no better news in all the world than this. So let us make it known. All of it. Most people in Birmingham, most people in Birmingham that you and I know have heard that 2,000 or so years ago Jesus died on the cross. That's not news to them. But most people in Birmingham have have no idea why it's important that Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago. Have no clue the divine problem that is at play here, and the divine answer that has been given here. And you know it. You know why Jesus died on the cross. So let us not be guilty of the sin of the desert, knowing where the water is and not telling anybody where to find it. Proclaim the hope of the gospel. That's one of the reasons why I want you to keep your your notes out. I want you to have some space at the bottom. I want you to Think, who do you know in your life during this Holy Week that you can share this with? As we look at the reality of the resurrection through the lens of the cross. And and let's pray, let's pray all week long. God, open eyes to see the beauty and the wonder of the cross.